It's stressing me out so much. Hey guys, welcome back. Mama Dr. Jones, OBGYN, and mom to four. Today we're going through an episode of a show that you guys have been asking me to go through for a very long time. An episode called Love's Labor Lost, and it came out, I think in like 1995, it won an Emmy. Let's jump right into season one, episode 19 of ER. I do remember watching this show with my mom when I was little and it's kind of nostalgic watching it now. Hey mom, uh, text me when you see this and tell me if you remember watching this episode back when it came out. Our baby's due in two weeks and I have to pee every 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. it, it burns and my stomach, stomach hurts. hurts. Sounds like a bladder infection. Does this hurt? No. Okay, so right off the bat, I'm curious why she's in the ER. Almost every hospital that has the facilities to care for pregnant patients will not see pregnant patients at this gestational age in the ER, particularly for what seems like a non-emergent visit. Initial BP is 130 over 90, but over a couple of hours, BP's been fine, around 120 over 80. FHT's normal, no cramps or spotting. He said her initial blood pressure was slightly elevated, 130 over 90, that's not terribly high. She's near-term pregnant. Her follow-up blood pressures have been normal. So none of that sounded immediately concerning to me based on what he said at this point. UA shows white cells too numerous to count, bacteria, two plus protein, CBC's normal, no fever. Simple cystitis, fluids, rest, and a course of bactrim. It's a bladder infection. I like how he explained to the patient what that means, a simple bladder infection, translating for people who are using medical terms that everyone may not understand is super important. They're talking about treating with Bactrim, which is an antibiotic. I probably would not choose Bactrim at near term. I might go with Keflex or something else. It increases the risk of some complications like jaundice after delivery. It's not overtly contraindicated. If it's the only thing we can use, it's an option, but it wouldn't be like my go-to when I have other options. I'm a little worried because her blood pressure was slightly elevated initially, and she has protein in her UA, which is urinalysis. So that makes me a little concerned about preeclampsia. If that's it, it's early. I think it'll probably get worse if that's what this is gonna center around, because we need to have the drama. Near-term antibiotic of choice is macrodantin. I want you to take these, lots of fluids, rest and follow up with your doctor in the morning. The sulfis compete with bilirubin for the binding sites on albumin, increasing the risk of neonatal jaundice. Saves lives, teaches. I think that management is probably fine, honestly. I, again, I'm still a little worried about the protein in the urine. If they have an obstetrician in-house, ideally she would be seen then. I don't know, maybe they don't have an OB in that hospital, but I don't know, it's fine. The reason I'm hedging on this is because I'm sure she's something else has to change or this episode wouldn't be so highly recommended from you guys for me to watch. My wife's unconscious in the car. Dr. Green! Please, somebody help me! Whoa, girl, I'll take the clamp thing. Sulfate, four grams, I am right. Your wife has a clamp here. Is she gonna die? No, no, we just need to get her admitted and medicated. She's seizing! This would be extremely unusual to have one very tiny elevation in your blood pressure and go straight into seizing, but not impossible. You can kind of hear in the background, he said her blood pressure is 160 over 110. That is a severe range blood pressure. She's seizing, so now she has eclampsia, which is protein in the urine, elevated blood pressures, which has now developed into seizures. Kind of in passing, you heard them say, mag in, which means they're giving her magnesium. Most of the time, the recommendation is stabilize mom and then get baby on the monitor and decide what to do. O2 to 15 liters. All right, let's hyperventilate or get dop tone. Fetal heart tone strong at 140. Why, where is the OB? Why is there not an OB? I need an OB. I'm freaking out. They keep talking about what the O2 setting should be on, but she doesn't have oxygen on. She doesn't have a mask on at all. And then when he was putting that jugular in, um, I mean, it was like not a needle, just like a catheter. She needs to have a baby today. If her seizures stop and she is able to be induced, that might be an option. But if she's not dilated and it's going to be 12 or 24 hours before you can have a baby, then it might make sense to go ahead and do a C-section. What did Coburn say? 
International. She's at St. Luke's, and she says she'll be here as soon as she's finished with her repeat shoe section. Oh, and she wants me to start an induction. That is, of course, if I feel comfortable. She said that? No. What a bitch. Okay, I have a problem with both that representation of the person that they were talking to and with that management. Under no circumstances would an ER doctor in an ER be starting an induction on an eclamptic patient. Not happening. If she's too busy at the other hospital to come over and see this patient, they need to find another OB to come right now. Unacceptable. Second, nobody's ever induced in an ER. That would never happen. That's not realistic. Third, if someone calls you and they're consulting you and you can't come right that second, the right thing to do is say, here's what we need to do. You can go ahead and do that if you're comfortable, to which the person on the phone should say, yeah, I am comfortable. Thank you for making sure that I was comfortable with that since I'm consulting you, which means I'm not the expert in this category. That's a bad attitude to have. I don't like that. I just spoke with Dr. Coburn, her OB attending, and she agrees that we need to deliver you soon. Does that mean you have to do a C-section? I want to deliver naturally. Well, your eclampsia is under control, the baby's in good shape, and the cervix is favorable. I'd say we do a trial of labor. I think that's a fine way to go. Her blood pressures are normal, her cervix is two and 80% thinned out. Like inducing labor and seeing if she can go ahead and get close to delivery without getting really high blood pressures again seems like a reasonable option. Yep. Well, do you feel competent to handle this down here without me? We're getting slammed upstairs. Yeah, I think I can muddle through. All right, I'll check back with you at, say, 2300. Roger. Carol? Yeah? Could you give Mrs. O'Brien 0.5 Pitocin IV? You're inducing down here? No, we're going to start here, and then we'll get her up to OB. Okay. No, not only not okay, but not realistic, would never happen. What could possibly be going on upstairs that is so much more important than an eclamptic patient in the ER? Transfer this lady to labor and delivery. They have an OB doctor there. I know he's a resident, but he's still more of an OB doctor than an ER doctor. That doesn't make any sense to me. Take her upstairs. This is dangerous. Bad plan. Change of plan. Is it normal for the baby's heart rate to be going down like that? As long as it's only briefly and it stays over 120. I disagree with that statement. That baby does not look happy and it's not perfectly fine as long as it's not less than 120. The pattern is very important and that pattern looks concerning. We're still busy upstairs. I got a call again. Dr. Curry, something's wrong. The baby's heart, the, the monitor's down to 90. Something's not right. It's not supposed to go that long, right? So 90 is a heart rate that definitely you should do something about, but is not always an emergency. It absolutely warrants them running to the room to see what's going on, but it's not like always a terrible thing. Sometimes it's as simple as repositioning mom, turning off the medicine, stopping the induction for a period of time to see if you can fix it. However, I still am extremely bothered by the fact that they are so busy upstairs that the eclamptic patient, which is a relatively rare major problem in obstetrics is the one sitting in the ER laboring on Pitocin. Like, this is just not realistic at all. Now we can get a pressure reading inside the uterus. This uh, scalp electrode monitors the pulse rate more exactly. She's eight centimeters dilated, completely effaced. Won't be long. Okay, so what they're doing now is putting an intrauterine pressure catheter in. Again, this would never be done in the ER, but I'm just gonna talk to you guys about it so you know what it is. The intrauterine pressure catheter is like a piece of IV tubing and it just sits next to the baby's head and it monitors the pressure of contractions. So the external monitor that's on her abdomen will tell us when she has a contraction, but not how strong the contractions are. The internal monitor will tell us how strong they are. I don't know this is the best time to place that. She's making excellent progress. And someone whose cervix is already changing, it doesn't really matter what their pressure catheter says because the cervix is changing and that's the goal and we don't need to know that. I do another intervention if it's not gonna change your management. The 
scalp electrode that they're talking about. So this is a monitor that goes on the baby's head. The reason we use this is because the external monitor is not always very reliable. It's relatively reliable, but if the baby is having decelerations and you need a really exact reading, a scalp electrode will monitor the baby's actual pulse, not have to just trace movement of the heart. So it's much more accurate. The way that it goes in is with, it has a teeny tiny little spiral looking needle thing, and it goes just very superficially into the baby's head. The way I explain it to patients is, you know when you were in middle school and people would take like a safety pin and just put it through the superficial layer of skin on their finger and it would look creepy, but didn't really hurt them? That's how it goes on to baby's head. I see some viral stuff going around Facebook about this sometimes and people really demonizing scalp electrodes. And I get it, like you don't want the scalp electrode on the baby's head. But again, it's an extremely superficial needle that goes right on the baby's head to monitor the pulse. It's less invasive than an IV and it can provide a lot of very valuable information. It certainly should be explained to the parents of what you're doing and how I explained it to you just now is how I would explain it in labor and delivery if my patient needed to have that. And uh, we need to get her up to OB. I'll see if I can light a fire under someone's butt. Is something wrong? No, we're okay. Paige Coburn again. Okay. Well, that was a terrible explanation on his part. He said, is everything okay? And I would have answered that question. Everything's fine. Nothing is an emergency right now. Baby's having some heart rate drops that we need to address. We can watch them for a period of time. We don't need to do anything right this second except try to make them better. If we're not making them better, then we may need to reevaluate the plan and if there is a safer way to deliver the baby like a C-section if we're not ready to deliver because we can watch this for a while and it's not an emergency, but we can't watch it for hours and hours. Fully dilated, 100% of face. It's time to start to push. Already? Yep. Here? Here, Carter. Oh, Carter, go up to OB and drag Drake down. Tell him to bring some forceps, okay? Go, go. She's not progressing. Baby's heart rate's dangerously low. I'm gonna start the pudendal block. I'm gonna try to stop addressing how unrealistic all of this is because I just can't handle it. Um, but I can tell you what a pudendal block is. So a pudendal block is a local anesthetic which is injected into the pudendal nerves. The pudendal nerves provide the nerve innervation for the perineum. So where the baby causes pain when crowning is served by the pudendal nerves and you can easily reach where those are by doing a cervical type exam. It's not really feeling of the cervix, but from a patient standpoint, it feels like having a cervical exam and you inject the local anesthetic and that helps to provide a nerve block to decrease the pain of crowning. An ER doctor would never do this. There's even a whole lot of OB doctors who don't do this procedure. I do. It's actually relatively easy if you're trained in it, but an ER doctor just would not be trained in this. Again, I just like, they're not going to go up to OB bring a doctor and forceps down and deliver this baby with forceps in the ER. None of this makes sense. No one will blame you if you wait for a B. The baby monitor says now or never. Why put your ass on the line? Because I've come this far, I'm gonna see it through. <laughs> what a shit coming by camel. Get her beat me. Ah! An ER doctor would never put forceps on a baby. Never, never, never. Many, many obstetricians are not even trained in forceps. They are a very skilled procedure. You can cause significant harm if you don't know what you're doing, and this would never happen, ever. Forceps are very safe in the hands of someone who knows how to use them. So I always explain this to my patients like, it's like using a scalpel. If I don't know how to use a scalpel and I'm not a surgeon, I could hurt you very, very bad with a scalpel. As a surgeon, I could still hurt you very bad, but it's very unlikely because I know what I'm doing. Forceps are the same way. If someone who has no idea what they're doing tries to put forceps on and pull a baby out, they can cause significant harm. That page OB! I gotta do something! Uh, let's try it once. It's stressing me out so much. It's not working. Seven, Ellie. <laughs> No. What are you doing? Uh, Javanelli, we gotta push the baby back in. Then what? 
almost over. Oh, we gotta roll We're on. Almost. Now they've got a shoulder dystocia. I don't know how they got all of these problems. Oh, maybe it's because they are delivering this baby in the ER instead of labor and delivery, and none of them know what they're doing. Shoulder dystocia means that the shoulder is stuck on the pubic bone. So if you imagine that one of the shoulders is stuck, the diameter here is what you're looking at. You want to decrease this diameter. If you can deliver the posterior arm, which is the arm that's on the bottom, so closest to the floor after the baby's head comes out, if you can pull that out and deliver it, see how this is a smaller diameter? You've decreased the AP diameter from this shoulder to this side. That will often resolve the shoulder dystocia. If you can't deliver that arm, there's other maneuvers to do. You're gonna go through each of those maneuvers at least three or four times before you jump to Zavanelli, essentially doing a C-section, but having to push the baby back in to get it out, which is extremely difficult to do, extremely difficult. Zavanelli is a last resort to try to save a life. And that is either the mom's life or maybe mom and baby. Most of us will knock on wood, never need to do a Zavanelli procedure, although most of us know someone who has had to do that. So it's extremely rare, but it's not something that never happens. I hope that I never experience that. We gotta do an emergency C-section. I need your consent. Dude, what the hell are you doing? Have you ever done this before? I scrubbed him many times. No, I want somebody else in here. Look, we can't wait. If we wait five more minutes, your baby's brain dead. I'm trying to participate in suspension of reality and not be so annoyed that it's very wrong, but just very not realistic. Go for our head. Down here. 7.5. If we're at this point, the chances that mom and baby make it out of this alive and with no major morbidities is very low. Mainly, I would say the biggest thing that's gone wrong in this is that they've failed to get the right people involved in the care of this patient. If they let it get to that point and then they have a happy outcome, I'm gonna be pissed because that is not how this would happen. Obviously, I want this to be a happy outcome, but geez. It should never get this chaotic in a hospital. It doesn't even matter if somebody is dying. There shouldn't be chaos in an operating room or an emergency room like this ever. Okay, everybody just take a deep breath, all right? Ten makes. And what he did right there was exactly right. As the leader of what's happening right now, he's responsible for making sure that everybody is staying calm. And that includes the patient, the patient's family, and especially the staff who's working with him. Saying, okay, everybody, calm down, take a deep breath, let's pay attention to what we're doing is really important. You can't let things like this get to where everybody's running around, knocking stuff over. People die that way. You have to keep your cool. Somebody physically go up to the OB and drag somebody down here, okay? Go. I'm sorry, but there is not an OB on the planet who would know that that's going on and need to be dragged down. I guarantee you, if the OB knew what was happening, they wouldn't need to be dragged. The communication from the ER to the other floor right now is abysmal. Get this the problem that has happened is an overestimation of confidence in doing something that you don't usually do. Remember earlier when I said that, when the OB said, are you comfortable with that? It wasn't like, oh, like, are you comfortable? You're so dumb. It was like, I just need to be sure that you're actually comfortable doing this if we're gonna do it. And he acted like, oh, how would somebody ask me that? What a total bitch. This is why I think, and I tell all of my medical students this, what makes you a good doctor or any kind of healthcare professional is being able to know when you don't know something and to say, I don't know, and I need someone who knows, or we need to look this up. There are so many points in this where someone on this team should have said, I don't know, we've got to find somebody who knows. They can't just keep doing things flying by the seat of their pants, it's dangerous. Scalpel. Let's see. Is that the fascia? Uh, 
Yeah, 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 that was right. Grab with those clippies. Hydrology in. I'm having a lot of trouble commenting on this, guys. I I know this episode won Emmys. I know you guys love it because you keep telling me that you remember it and that it stuck with you, but it's just not very realistic. Grab an army navy. Suction. Mets. The long scissors. Retract there. I'm in. Isn't there something about a bladder flap? Pickups. Suction. I'm dividing the peritoneum. He missed that. Okay, we're in. I can't even begin to go over the inaccuracies because there's so many. Like how the OR is open to a waiting room where everybody can see what's happening. Like how half the people in the operating room don't have on a mask and aren't gowned. How all of the steps of the C-section they just talked about were completely out of order. I think I'm in. Oh my God. There's two liters in there. She's got an abruption. She's bleeding out. Water, chin, gown up. Too thick. Suction, suction his nose. Umbilical clamp. He's not breathing. Of course he's not breathing. I, why would you expect him to be breathing at this point after that utter chaos? Aside from the fact that there is no way that an ER doctor would be doing his Avenelli procedure, if you just erase all that, so inaccurate. I'm having a hard time. Maybe I'm not even gonna post this one. Carter, get in here, follow my hand down. Feel the aorta? Oh no. It's pulsing. Yeah, I do. Okay, push down on it and don't let go. You got it? Okay, so. Don't think too. I got it. TV mask, is he alive? Uh, what is going on with mom? They think that compressing the aorta is gonna keep her from bleeding out right now. She's dying. She's dying. I think I'm in. Bag him. Quick listen. I'm gonna try an umbilical line. Release the clamp. Come on, little guy. Come on. What's going on in here? I intubated. This baby went bad. You just cut her open when you shouldn't have, and you left her on the OR table bleeding out and there are 15 other people in the room who could do neonatal resuscitation, but you're the only one apparently capable of doing surgery, which I, you're not trained for that, but whatever. And you left your patient on the table. You knew she'd erupted? No, once I got in there, the baby nearly died. Who is this and what's he doing in there? John Carter, med students, and I'm pressing on the aorta. It's a damned mess. What'd you use, a chainsaw? Well, I could... Get an NICU transport team over here and the OB resident on call. You should have let me know you were in over your head. Let's get a fall in. So not the right time to be addressing this like that, but yes, you should have. Why did he not call her again when the patient was five centimeters, then the patient was eight centimeters, like there was all this time where he should have been in touch with her. However, at the time that this is happening, he should have given her a quick rundown of where we're at with the patient, what's going on, and she should have been scrubbing and getting gowned up and getting in to save or salvage whatever's going on surgically, not yelling about the situation. Go be with your baby. There's nothing you can do down She's here. She's gonna be okay, right? She's stabilized. Go with your son. Two. Look, Green. She's crashing. Pull her off that respirator and bag her. Her blood stopped clotting. She's going into the IC. Oh, damn. Order of 10 units. This is extremely hard for me to watch. DIC after an abruption causing a patient to code is something that can really happen. So that part is realistic, but the whole string of events that led up to this happening is just really not. I just think it's really important to point out because I, I don't know if anybody ever watches this anymore. I know it's a really old show now, but that could be very scary watching it. And I guess there certainly is a reality where this could happen, but I can't fathom why any of that string of events would have happened in that way in the ER. And I know it wouldn't have happened that way under the care of somebody trained in obstetrics. You know, I did a lot of ranting about this isn't realistic and I try to do a little teaching in there, but the biggest takeaway from this episode that I get is medicine is a team sport that requires excellent communication. And when you don't do that, when you can't act as a team, when you can't admit your own scope of practice and your own 
degree of understanding and ask for help, that's when you become dangerous. <laughs> I'm calling it. Time of death, 0646. I didn't really expect this episode to go this way. Watching something like that unfold is really hard. Maternal mortality, while it's not something that we as healthcare providers feel in the same way that a family member or a friend feels it when their loved one dies, most of the time it's somebody that we care about a lot. It's not something we see all the time, thank God, but it is something that happens. It is very, very, very common for it to end the career of the obstetrician. Not because they're forced out, not because they were bad at what they do, but because it's just extremely hard to move past. to end this. That was extremely depressing. Um, I hope that I would make different decisions than the team that was taking care of her in this episode. And I would hope that I would communicate better and admit my scope of practice more quickly. All right. I don't know how to end this. That was extremely depressing. So I'm just gonna... Thanks for being here. Subscribe if you want to. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind, and I will see you next time.